Well, today uh, we are beginning a new series that we are entitling Angels, and we've sung about that a little bit today, and uh, this is a series that really has been stirring within me for a couple years, but it's just kind of now uh, coming to fruition, but I don't know what you think about when you think about angels, uh, with it being Valentine's week. I don't know if you think about Cupid uh, with uh, his little angel wings on the back. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you think about, um, maybe you think about the, the movie, Angels in the Outfield, taking it back all the way to the 1990s. Uh, maybe you think about, I just love that movie when, they, when they're, you know, the guys in the, in the outfield and the angels come through and lift them up to get that catch. And, and maybe that's your perception of kind of how angels work. Uh, I could have used an angel yesterday when I was running in the kids' Mercedes Marathon. Uh, along about mile 0.5, I was, <laughs> I was struggling. Uh, maybe when you think about angels, you think about another movie, uh, The City of Angels also came out in the, in the 90s with Nick, Nicolas Cage, Meg Ryan. Uh, or maybe you think about uh, some songs, some uh, popular songs that have the word angels in them. Uh, the group Alabama came out with a song years ago, you know, I believe that there are angels among us. Uh, Amy Grant back in the 80s had a song, you know, about angels watching over me. Uh, so I don't know where where your mind goes when you, when you think about the subject uh, of angels. Um, when it comes to angels, there's a multiplicity of, of thought and ideas uh, that are surrounded with that subject. And I read recently that 82% of Americans, this was a, a Baylor religious study, 82% 82, 82 of Americans believe in angels. Uh, another another research uh, said that 70, I think 75% or so, but but regardless, a, a lot of people in America believe in this idea of angels. And so for the next few weeks, I want us to, to look at this and, and really focus on uh, what does uh, the Bible say about angels. And uh, this is going to be our primary resource, as it, as it should be, over the next few weeks. Uh, but I've also listed in your worship guide some other resources that, that I've come across that, that I've been reading and using. And, and one of the things that I, I try to do as I, as I preach, and I have for the past six years, is, is I, don't, I don't come to you, as Paul says, with eloquence of speech. Um, I, I'm not a guru on this subject. This is not my lifelong study that is now being presented to you. That's, that's not how I typically approach subjects. Um, for the past six years, I have tried to uh, invite you along on a journey, and, and that, that I don't come to you as the expert, but I, I come to you as one who, who walks alongside and, and studies alongside you and searches the scriptures with you. And so I'm, my commitment to you is that that's what I'm going to be doing these next few weeks as we study this. And my encouragement to you and my invitation to you is that you do the same thing over the next few weeks. Uh, that you, you get in, in the Word yourself, and that, that you even use some of these resources that may be of help to you. You'll notice there in your worship guide that there's three resources that I've listed. The one is by a gentleman named Scott McKnight, The Hum of Angels. Uh, that book just came out this week. Um, and then there's one from 1998, uh, Joe Beam, uh, Seeing the Unseen. And some of you have been exposed to that material. Joe's actually been here years ago and talked about that. Um, and then all the way back to 1978, there was a, a book called The Study of Angels by Edward Myers, and, and he's a Harding University guy, and, and that, uh, that resource is in there as well. And, and one of the things that I like about these three resources is that it spans over the past 40 years. And so you'll notice the dates on each of those, uh, the oldest being 1978, and then Joe's material being in 98, and then a, a book that just came out this week by Scott McKnight, a theologian that I've come to respect over the past few years. Uh, so I want to encourage you, if, if you're a small group or if you personally want to, want to get into some of these resources and, and have those as walk, walk besides, I would, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, but if you, if you Google uh, angel books or if you even go to Amazon.com and just put books that have angels in them, uh, Amazon.com records over 128,000 resources uh, for this topic. So it, it's, a, it's a topic that's been widely talked about, but, 
But we want to get into the next few weeks, what, is, what does the Bible say, and, and how can we be informed by that? And so that, that's going to be my encouragement to us all over the, the next few weeks. The Bible actually has a lot to say about angels. And I was almost blown away in these past few months as I've been kind of studying this topic, uh, just how much the Bible talks about angels. There are over 300 references to angels in the Bible. They're mentioned in 34 books in the Bible, 17 in the Old Testament, 17 in the New Testament. If you start looking and you start searching, uh, it's almost like they're on just about every single page. Uh, This is where Scott McKnight got the title of his book, The Hum of Angels. Uh, He lives in a small town, and and he had bought this hummingbird feeder. And uh, after a period of several weeks, he realized that he had not seen any hummingbirds come and and partake from his feeder. So he got a little frustrated, and he, he took the hummingbird feeder back, and the pet shop owner asked Scott, where do you live? And Scott told him where he lived, and the shop owner said, well, you need to know that that hummingbirds are all around that area. Matter of fact, they're not just all all around your area, and that whole community, hummingbirds are very, very present. And then Scott said the the line, the takeaway line that the shop owner said after that, the take-home message, he said, "You you just have to have eyes to see them. And once you do, you will see them everywhere. And McKnight goes on to suggest that angels are, are everywhere. Uh, you just have to tune in uh, to, to their presence. Now, I'm not suggesting that after this series, we're just going to start seeing angels everywhere, and, and that's, just, that's, that's not the point of this series. Uh, but the point is, is that, that God's Word has a lot to say about angels. One of the most influential theologians of the 20th century, the Swiss theologian Karl Barth, said that in his multi-volume study of what Christians believe called church dogmatics, Barth states, take God and the angels or drop both. But God without the angels is impossible. According to Barth, it is true, of course, that we can miss the angels. We can deny them altogether. We can dismiss them as superfluous or absurd and comic. If we cannot or will not accept angels, how can we accept what is told us by the history of Scripture or the history of the church or the history of the Jews or our own life's history? Where God is, there the angels of God are. Where there are no angels, there is no God. So the first passage of Scripture that I I want us to turn to is in Psalm 148. And I want us to look at this, and uh, we've already sang a, a similar song this morning, uh, but in Psalm 148, verses 1 and 2, uh, we read this, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly host. And as we begin this series, I want to offer uh, three, uh, what I, I believe are, are really, really important reflections from Scripture uh, on the subject of angels. Uh, And the first one is this, if you're taking notes, you want to write this one down, is that the Lord has angels, but don't ever forget that the angels have a Lord. I think that's very important throughout this series, that we remember this. And and I'm going to harp on this a a few times. One of the dangers of a series like this is that uh, we become fixated on, on something other than Jesus. Uh, That's one of the dangers throughout this series. Um, I I believe, and what I've come to find in my own study is, and you're going to hear me say this a lot throughout this series, is that being enlightened on angels does not make you any more saved. Being enlightened on angels does not make you or I any more saved. But I believe being encouraged by angels will make us more bold in our faith. And so I'm excited about the next few weeks and what I believe that God is going to reveal to us. You can't take the Bible seriously and dismiss the reality of angels. 
which is one of Jesus' criticisms of a group known as the Sadducees. They didn't take the Bible very seriously. Uh, they only took part of the Old Testament and called that Bible, and they didn't believe in the resurrection. And Sadducees did not believe in angels. And if you read the Gospels, you find that Jesus didn't think they were very serious students in the Word, nor were they very serious about the Word who became flesh, Jesus Christ himself. And so, what are angels, and why should we study them? First, you know, why should we study angels? And I think there are several reasons, but uh, a few that we will mention today is that uh, in this book, as we've already said, the angels always aff affirm that they have a Lord. I believe as uh, followers of Jesus, we want to get to know our Lord. Amen? We want to get to know the Lord God Almighty. And, and every time that you see the, the angels appear in Scripture, what you're going to see is that, that they are not appearing for themselves' sake. That they are appearing for the sake of the Lord and pointing us to Him. Uh, the Bible says a lot about angels. Matter of fact, the Bible says more about angels than it does a lot of the stuff that we split churches over. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> in the next few weeks, uh, we're going to see in Scripture where angels are extremely interested in what we're do doing. And, and by we, I mean the church. Uh, the scripture says that the angels long to look into some certain things, and we're going to look at that. And so if they're so interested in us, I think it may do us well to show a little bit of interest in them and see why that is. Secondly, what are angels? So why, why are we studying them, and what are angels? Several terms are used in Scripture to describe angels. Uh, the term, uh, Hebrew word, malak, uh, occurs 108 times in the Old Testament. The Greek word angelos occurs 186 times in the New Testament. So angels are actually referenced more in the New Testament than they are in the Old Testament. Uh, but this word simply is interpreted often as, as messenger. Uh, but, to, but one scholar says to simply interpret this word just as messenger does not always yield the intended meaning. It says that anyone, whether a celestial or or terrestrial being uh, can be considered a messenger. But context, not necessarily definition, I'm going to give us a definition here in a minute, but context is the ultimate means to determine the way that any word is used. Angels are also called holy ones. They're called servants. They're called morning stars. And as we just read in Psalm 148, they are called uh, host, the host of heaven. Uh, Martin Luther, we talked about Wednesday night as we had a worship Wednesday in the gym. We, we talked about a, a song that Martin Luther wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And he would go around and he would get these different tunes and melodies from bars and taverns, and then he would put uh, lyrics to those tunes, and that's where A Mighty Fortress is Our God came from. But there's, there's a word in that song, uh, sabioth, which just means the host's of heaven. And, and that word host uh, shows up several times in the Bible. Uh, when we think about the host of heaven, we also need to remember that there is a Lord of the host. So what, what I want us to do for the next few minutes is look at five passages in, in Scripture that describe angels. Uh, but first I want to give you a description to write down. Uh, so if you're, writing, if you're writing stuff down this morning, write, write this down. This is a description of angels. Angels are spirit beings created to execute God's will in heaven and on earth. Now I want to be very clear about this description. Uh, there could be something missing or something incomplete about this description. And if there is, I want you to blame me, Okay. But what we're going to do uh, for the next few minutes is, is look at some scriptures to, to, see, uh, to see if there's a support here for uh, kind of what this description talks about. So the first one is Hebrews chapter 1. If you'll flip over to your New Testament in Hebrews chapter 1, where the Hebrew writer says in verse 14, Are not all angels 
ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Angels are spirit beings, that they are capable of emotion. They are capable of uh, rejoicing, Scripture says. Um, they're capable of volition. That means they can, they can choose to obey or disobey. They're capable of intellect. They long to look into the story of salvation, 1 Peter 1 tells us. So they are spirit beings, but even though they are personal, conscious beings, they do not possess flesh and blood. They are supernatural beings. Not superstitious, but they are super nature beings. They belong to a completely different dimension of creation that you and I, limited to the natural order, can scarcely comprehend. Um, now, as spirits, they do not age, they don't get sick, and they do not die. They are a different order of creation, spirit beings. Next, so they are spirit beings, but next they are created. Uh, th this is important, I believe, that angels have not always existed. Like you and I, they were created. Uh, they are not eternal in the sense that they have always existed. So, so God is eternal. He's always been. He's, he's the great I was and the great I will be and the, and the great I am, as Justin talked about last week in his uh, I am message. And so, so, so angels are, are not eternal, but they are immortal. They were created. Where do we uh, get that? Well, let's look at Psalm 148, verse 2, which we've already read. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Now go down a few verses to Psalm 148, 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at His command they were created. Talking about the angels. And then go on to Colossians, back over in your New Testament, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, speaking of Jesus. For in Him all things were created. Notice, things in heaven and on earth. Notice, visible and invisible. There's an invisible creation. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Just like us, it is Jesus that sustains the angels, the supremacy of Christ. If, if Jesus quit sustaining angels, they would, they would cease. It's Jesus who sustains the visible, and it's Jesus who sustains the invisible. Angels are, are mighty, and angels are powerful. Yes, angels are wise, but angels do not possess the omni-attributes of God. They can be anywhere quickly, but they can't be everywhere at once, like God. They are not omnipresent. They know a lot, but they don't know everything. They're not omniscient. They're not omnipotent. They're, they're powerful, but, but not like God is. And so all the amazing qualities of angels they get from God. And lastly, angels are created to execute God's will. So angels serve as, as instruments to accomplish God's will in heaven and on earth. That kind of rounds out our description that we gave a few moments ago. And in heaven, there is, and we're going to look at this in the coming weeks, in heaven there is a myriad of beings. But isn't it curious, there's, there's only one will. That even though there's a myriad of beings in heaven... Jesus would say in his prayer that we looked at last month in our Live the Prayer series in Matthew chapter 6, your kingdom come, your will be done, your one will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even though there's thousands of beings, there's one will in heaven. And they have a choice, these angels, and must, most have chosen to execute that one will. And we'll talk about that more in the coming weeks, about their choice um, spirit beings created to execute God's will in heaven on earth. Now let's look at one more passage. We'll note here that angels were created before men. How much before? 
Don't know. But we believe that they were created before men. Look at Job chapter 38, verse 4 through 7. The Lord spoke to Job. He said, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? And who laid its cornerstone? While in the morning, the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Which brings us to our second reflection that I want you to write down. Is that angels aren't here to impress you with themselves. Angels are here to impress you with the Lord of hosts. So why has our culture been so enamored with these spirit beings, with angels, over the years. Well, you've read about us being in what scholars refer to as a postmodern age, and even now, some are saying that we're now in a post-postmodern age, or what's known as meta-modernism. But regardless, our age has given up on modernity. So modernity and enlightenment came along and we thought science and technology were going to solve all our problems. And we gave up on the spiritual and only believed in the rational. We came up with scientific theory for the existence of everything, and if we couldn't put it in a test tube, then it wasn't real. So what happened after 300 years of modernity? Well, we still had all the problems that we had before. And so there's an idea that, that maybe we want to connect with something invisible, something that has a, a spiritual dimension, but, but it, in a legitimate le yet maybe misguided attempt to connect to the spiritual world, culture has embraced angels. Eighty-something percent of Americans believe in angels. It's a way to stay in touch with the invisible. There's something out there protecting me. There's something out there helping me. There's something out there giving me comfort, but not making any demands on my life or not giving me any judgments. And so Life Magazine called the angel movement several years ago, God Light. And angels assure us, they comfort us, but they never warn us. They never challenge us to, to think uh, or make demands on our life. They become collectibles, right? We collect angels. Now, I'm pretty sure that if you read through Scripture, every time an angel shows up in Scripture, the person that they show up to does not ever say, you know what, I think I want a bobblehead of you. <laughs> it never happens. So, as we go through this study the next few weeks, I would encourage all of us to this kind of last reflection, to stay alert for the host of the Lord, but put your hope in the Lord of the host. I'm thankful that the culture wants to connect to the invisible, but anytime that happens, the enemy is going to show up. And the enemy is going to, to try to establish an illegitimate way to go about that. And so angels in Scripture always point to God. They always point to His holiness. They always point to His righteousness. And I think we would do well throughout these next few weeks of this study to, to recognize that, that the, our encouragement, our, our faith is going to be built but it's not going to be built by us just looking to angels. It's going to be us looking to the one that angels look to. And so that's my encouragement over the next few weeks. One of the scriptures that I, I want us to close with and, and read together is from Romans chapter 8 and verse 38. And I'm going to ask us to stand and read God's word together. If you'll read this with me, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the church said, Amen.
Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. We thank you that we can trust your word. We thank you that it's good. God, this is a a topic that I readily confess that I'm not an expert in. But I know what has happened in, in my study these past few months is that I have been encouraged and my, my faith has been strengthened. And so I pray that as a faith family that, that that will be the case for all of us. Father, may we, may we meditate on four words this week. God is for us. God is for us. Father, as we just read in your word, nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. We pray that these mysterious beings will once again point us to your love and point us to a life in your Son. So bless us as we go through this study these next few weeks. And all things we give you thanks. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. We'll have a shepherd down front if you would like to receive prayer this morning. If today is the day that you want to put on the Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ, in baptism, I want you to come see me. We'd be glad to do that today. Also, there'll be a shepherd and his wife back here in this room in what we call our chapel. If you'd like a more private setting to pray with someone. And I would encourage you to, we still have our take a prayer, leave a prayer, prayer station over here. Uh, If you have a prayer request that you'd like to offer up, I check those regularly. I would love to pray over that. Uh, Whatever your need, come as we sing this song. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before. I know who stands behind the God of angel 
Thank you for being here with us this morning, and glad to have you here today. Looking forward to this series on angels and, and how that works in our lives.